Thank you for tuning in to the Bethel Temple Faith Church broadcast. We appreciate your viewership and we're confident that there's a word of God for you today. Now with today's message, our pastor and founder, Pastor Bertram D. Hinton Jr. Today, out of verses 9 through 12 of 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 9 through 12. This is uh, somewhat of a familiar passage of scripture, but God has given me a real revelation today. Uh, out of, I believe he gives me a real revelation all the time, but he gave me a revelation today out of this that I had never looked at before, and uh, I'm excited to deliver it today out of 2 Samuel 2 chapter 6, verses 9 through 12, and if your heart is right, uh, I believe you'll be blessed today. Amen. 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 If you have 2 Samuel chapter 6, Verse 9, would you acknowledge by saying amen? Amen. amen? amen. And the scriptures are also on the screens throughout the sanctuary. The word reads on this wise, And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his house. Verse 12, and it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. With the help of the Lord this morning, I'm going to preach from this thought. Take your time. Take your time. Mm -hmm. Take your time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you now for the anointing necessary and the accuracy needed to preach and to teach this word today. I ask God that you now let the people into our private time. That those things which you said to me in preparation would now be released full circle. That they would be able to hear and receive the engrafted word of the Lord today. I ask God that you would touch my mind. Remind me of the moments that we spent. And bring me back to a place, God, where we can preach and teach with accuracy. I pray now for supernatural recall of your word. That back to my mind comes every illustration, every nugget, every scripture, every word. That everything you intend to be said today would be said for your glory. Now bless the hearts and the minds of your people to be able to receive, hear, know, and understand what is the word of the Lord this day. God, we promise to give your name the praise. Yes. I'm pulling on the Holy Ghost for power to preach today. Yes. That you would let me preach outside of myself to bring people back to you. Not draw them to me, but that glory goes to your name. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. And amen. Take your time. When we hear the phrase, take your time, often our minds point, Brother Ke Keon, to uh, us slowing down. Uh, when you hear the phrase, take your time, you, you often think about needing to just back up and reassess. But today, I want us to look at that phrase a little differently. I'm not asking anybody. To slow down, I'm simply asking you to take your time. Go ahead, preacher. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm asking you today yes, sir. to take your time. That's good, preacher. Uh, the, the, the word take, the word take is defined by Merriam Webster to be uh, take is to get possession of, to capture, or to seize, to get possession of, to capture or to seize. Take also means to get a hold of, to obtain, to acquire, and to assume. Again, take to get possession of, to capture, or to seize. To get hold of, to obtain, acquire, or assume. Here's what I love about take. It simply means to use. It means to use. All right? The, the, word, the word time, the word time, the very brief and clear definition, it simply is every moment 
there ever has been or ever will be. That's time. Every moment there ever has been or ever will be. Time is also the period during which something exists or happens. The period during which something exists or happens. Take your time. He's saying today for us to grab hold of, for us to obtain, for us to capture and to seize our time. Well, well Pastor, how is it in the reading of this particular text that we can see or note what it is that you're trying to tell us today from the Lord. Well, the story here in 2 Samuel chapter 6 tells us about a man by the name of David. It's very key that we remember that David is our character for today because he's going to help us make sense out of this before we go home. David, who in fact, Minister Black, yes, is now, Elder Black, excuse me, is now at a time where he reigns as king, but desires for the presence of God to be within his reach and within his grasp. Yes, he knows that there have been battles in the past with the Philistines, that the Philistines, Sister Matilda's, have actually taken the Ark of the Covenant and now have had it in, his, in their possession. He knew that the presence of God had fallen into the wrong hands. So for Kanye, he was going to do everything within his power to get God's presence in its rightful place. The scripture says that he goes on this journey to go get the Ark of the Covenant of God, to bring it with him back into the city of David or into Jerusalem. In the process of doing, there's a man by the name of Uzzah who in fact is helping to carry the Ark. And one of the cattle that was carrying the Ark started to shake a little bit. It due to the presence of God and the ark of God began to fall. The scripture says that Uzzah reached out his hand wow. to stop the ark of God from hitting the ground, but because he touched the presence of God the wrong way, the Bible says he was stricken dead at the spot. David then says, God, when we pick up the day, how in the world am I going to be able to move your presence into his right place if when I tried to do it the last time, when I tried to take it the last time, people around me died. He says, God, what in the world am I going to do? So what he does is he takes a left turn and puts the ark in the house of a man by the name of Obed-Edom. The Bible says that because the ark rested in his house for three months, there were continual blessings wow. that were flowing in the house of Obed-Edom. Why is that important for me to understand as I attempt to uh, paint the picture for today? What I want us to get, Brother Lipscomb, is this. Many times when we have an idea and a thought that we want to do a thing for God, and it seems as though failure surrounded it, the way I know that my time is still right is that the blessing of God is still showing yes. even when he had to punish me for the wrong I did. Yes. Let me help you because many times when we try things, we got a business idea, we got an idea for a thing and we go out there and fall on our face, we'll say, well God, it must not be my time. But I got a word for you today, it is your time. Because if God is still blessing those around you, if God is blessing other folk who are starting when you started, he's giving you to know that your time is right. It's just some things you got to do to appropriately take it. Uh, okay, it's, it's going to make sense. I promise I am. Okay, it's going to make sense. So, so, so when I began to look and listen to God, okay, God, what do you have me to say? He said, son, I want you to look at the variations of take. I said, okay, so, so I began to look even in the dictionary, and I saw it was funny because it was four additional things that connected to take that had something to help us understand what take means. The first thing that I found in take is that if I'm going to ever take something, I must first take it in. All right, so, so, so point number one I'm teaching today, uh, in, in taking your time, it requires me to take in. All right, put your, what, what's take in? Take in simply means to get understanding of a thing. When God, when Wendy is moving, he wants us to be willing to slow down long enough in taking our time that we gain understanding connected to what it is that he's attempting to do. 
David understood that God was for him. That's the definition of understanding, by the way. He understood that God was for him because he saw the blessing of the Lord that was reigning in the house of obed -Ed. He says, God, it is impossible for this not to be my right time. If what I was trying to do is prospering, I'm just not in it. Yes. Help me right here, yes. Jesus. God, God says, take a look at the idea you had. And when it was that you fell on your face, the question is, do you still see prosperity in the idea? Yeah. Wow. Do you still see other people's real estate companies succeeding? Yeah. So if success is in that area, yeah. apparently it is the time. I just need you to learn how to take some stuff in first. Right. I need you to go get slowed down enough to grab understanding about how to do this thing the right way. Right. Help me not to preach too quick, Jesus. I just want to talk. I promise I'm going to preach in a minute. He says, David had to get understanding. Yes, sir. The Bible says that when it was, he heard that God had blessed Obed Edom every day for 90 days. Wow. He says, okay, God, what in the world did I do that was wrong? He says, hey, David, what I need you to grab is not that the idea was off. It's just that your order was wrong. Well, me, but, Powell, listen to me. Uh, listen to me, Minister Power. He says, it's not that you haven't been anointed to do it. It's just that you didn't understand order yet. That's it. Come on, Go ahead. Help me. He says, yes, you're gifted to do that thing, but it requires you to do it in the right order. Oh, David right. says, how am I going to learn the order? If I'm just operating based on what I thought I already knew. He says, David, what you've got to do is make sure that you go back and do it the way I prescribed the first time. Preacher, what are you trying to tell me? Sometimes, Rochelle, we got to go back to the first word we heard from the Lord. I don't need to stand here listening for the next word about where I'm going to go five years from now. Just replay the first thing he told me to do. And the Bible says that the first thing they found is when you move the ark, you got to make sure you got the right people around you to get the ark moved. He says, you better go find some folks that are worshiping me in spirit and in truth. Not just worshiping me on Sunday. Not just worshiping me because they're in the right family. But the folks who got the right heart towards me. David, he says, I need you to go back and get the sons of Levi. Go get the men who know how to work at the altar. Stop getting televangelists to call. And yeah, but you better go to somebody that you know has the authority. He, he says, yes, sir. it's not that your idea is wrong. But you need somebody that's in order to bless what you're trying to do. Because if you just try to go out here on your own, you're going to be just like us and find yourself dead in the pool doing what you thought was right, but having the wrong order. He had to get understanding of order. Not only did he have to get understanding of order, Minister Black, he had to get an understanding of the idea. Okay, when he was taking in, all this is on the requirement of taking in. He had to get understanding of the idea. Mom, what does that mean? That bit, David, I need to know why you want my presence there. Uh, it, it, are, are you doing it just because you're the king and you want people to say that my presence is in your possession or are you really doing it to point people back to me and that's a word for somebody right there who think you got a ministry idea are you doing it because you think you will drive an escalator or are you doing it because you're trying to point people back to me for somebody that's got a business idea are you doing it just because you're trying to get rich or are you doing it to point people back to me somebody that's got a book idea are you doing it just to get notice for being on a New York Times bestseller or are you doing it to point people back to me? He says when you're taking in what your time is I need you to get an idea I need you to get an understanding of the idea why do I need to do this now? And the Bible says that as David recognized for these 30 days that God was blessing Obed-Edom's house, he, for these 90 days that God was blessing Obed-Edom's house, he began to think about how he could do things differently. And when I look at the parallel in 1 Chronicles, the 15th chapter, the Bible says that David now got his order in line. Yes. He says, I can't mess with Uzzah and Abinadab and them no more. I'm going back to the original ones based on what God said the first time. He says, I'm not going to go and try to bring God's presence in a new way. Help me right there not to get in trouble. I'm not 
going to bring God's presence in by cutting out my Bible study, but I'm going to get God's presence by doing it the way I've seen it done in the past. I'm not going to do it by cutting out my intercessory prayer. I'm going to do it by the way I've seen God do it in the past. I would be a fool to grow a church one way and then try to do it another way when I get where I think I'm going. Uh, let me help you. Let me help you because many of us have gotten. I was talking. We were coming back from Florida and we were having wow. a discussion in the car, and we began to talk about so many things that are happening in churches all across the world. And I'm not here to knock nobody's church or knock nobody's idea for what they do in church. But what I will say is this: whenever God has blessed you based on one way, the way you keep the blessing is to keep doing it the same way. You can't build a church on Bible studies, but then when you grow, you cut Bible study out. Because what will happen is your growth will cut out with your Bible study. Wow. Oh, so when we get these ideas power, I hope you missed it, Timmy. Uh, because the reality is this. Whatever way you start is the way you better finish. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you started in prayer, you better finish in prayer. If you started with Bible study, you better finish with Bible study. Yeah. If you started with Sunday school, you better finish. Let me go pick you up. That's why your kids all over the place right now. Because you refuse to bring them to the place where you learned about God. Oh, yeah. That's good. You got to, I've been going to Bible study since I was two. I ain't going to Bible study no more in my life. That's why you got a bunch of heathens in your house. That's it. It requires us to take in understanding. Get an understanding of order. Order simply means I can't do it my way. God is not a Burger King God. He's a king of kings. God. He's not the I do it my way any way I want it. No, we got to do it his way. Even when you got a good idea. You got to do the idea for Jordan his way. David had the right idea to bring the presence of God back to the right place, but he tried to do it his own way. So his ministry failed because he did it the wrong way. <sighs> okay, all right. That was my tough part. This will get exciting after this. It requires us to take in, not only to take in understanding, which is order and idea. The second point I want to give you, it is also, it requires us to take back. Mm -hmm. It requires us to have, if you want to take this for the note, to have a take back strategy. Teach them on take your time. Take your time. I said, before I can take, I got to first take in. I got to get understanding about what it is I'm doing. This is the teachable part of the message. And then it requires me to have a take back strategy. What does that look like? Uh, Brashel singing. A take back strategy is a, a method to retrieve what I have lost. All right, all right, preacher, you got to help me now. David, who's getting ready to go and get back this art of the covenant, when he was going through his process after he had taken in and gotten understanding about the order that had to come about, now he's taking back, he's reviewing his take back strategy. And one thing I began to remember about David that was so unique is that there's a story in the Bible, in fact, in the first Samuel, first Samuel, 30th chapter, where in fact David has experienced experience loss. And the scripture says that he was in a place called Ziglag. And he came back and he looked there and every one of the women and children had been taken and the city had been burned. And the scripture says that the men who were with David, about 600 of them, they began to cry so much that they didn't even have no more strength left to cry. Jenkins, they had taken Ace from you. You might have been ivory to the kasha, but they took Ace. Help me. The reality is this. When they had taken the babies and the wives, they had taken everybody. The scripture says that after the men began to cry, Deacon Graham, they started getting together and said, let's kill David. Because if we wouldn't have been fine following him, we could have protected our homes. These are the men that were with David. These are the men that David helped save their lives. These were the men that David had laid hands on and spoke well of. They were getting ready to kill their pastor. And the scripture says that David in this moment he doesn't have anywhere to turn. Because all of his help is gone, his wife is gone, the children are gone, and his armor bearers got stones in their hand getting ready to kill him. He says, I got to find some kind of way to hear from the Lord. 
he finds the one man who's still on his side, and that's the priest. He tells the priest, go get me the ephod. I, I need to go talk to the Lord so that I can get the right take back strategy. He says, I need to go and ask God a few questions. God, what, do I, what am I supposed to do about these men who swore their allegiance to me three verses ago, but are ready to kill me right now? These men who I just got feed five minutes ago are ready to kill me now. What is my take back strategy? And David says, the Lord began to tell him, all you got to do is go get it. Preacher, what are you trying to tell me? In my take back strategy, what I need to have happened was, I needed to have experienced loss at some point in my life so that I could know how to get back what I thought I lost. I got a word for somebody. Your bankruptcy was actually on purpose because God needed to teach you how to get things back. That rocky decision you went through and that rocky spell you went through in your marriage was worth it because God had to use it to give you some experience to develop a strategy to know how to take things back. But preacher, in case you missed the point, what was the strategy? The take back strategy was prayer. When I learned how to go seek the face of God when everybody who used to be for me is now against me when the folk that used to say they love me are ready to stone me and run my name through the mud. All I got left is to go to God and pray. I've got a word for every man sitting under the sound of my voice. If you want to see your family get better, learn how to go get your ephod. If you want to see your family life get better, go grab your prayer, your prayer cross and talk to the Father. Tell him I need a take back strategy to restore my madness. I need a take back strategy to restore my family. I need a take back strategy to restore my community. The need is on us. He says, you need it to experience loss. You need it to go through a portion where you have to lose somebody that was close to you. You need it to go through a time where you have to separate some from some folk who won't really for you no way, man of God, so that you can get a strategy in your life that no matter whoever turns their back on you, I know I got one that will stand for me, and that is God. That when everybody, my enemies and everybody, my friends, they forsake me, when I look to God, I got to take back strength. Uh, so the Bible says, please be seated. I'm just talking. The Bible says that David had a take back strategy. He realized that in order for him to now go get what God had for him, he had to pull on the experience of his past. But listen, you'll catch this analogy. That's just like a football coach. If he wants to continue to beat the same opponent, what he does is he doesn't go look at film on a new opponent. He goes and looks back at how he performed against the opponent the last time. So now the only thing I gotta do is keep the same system in place. I might have to teach some new players a new position, but I know that this system will work. Preacher, what are you trying to tell me? God gives me a system and a strategy when I'm going through what I'm going through. I hear the Holy Ghost. He told me to tell somebody stop crying and pick up the strategy. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. You're crying and complaining about the rough patch you're in. God said, dry your tears today and pick up the strategy that I'm trying to teach you. I'm trying to show you that even when it looks like you don't have nowhere else to turn, you can always turn it to me. I don't know about anybody else, but I've been in some situations in my life, Minister Williamson, where I didn't have anywhere else to turn. I was trying to put it together in my mind as to how it was going to connect when there were needs that was showing up in a financial way and I knew that I didn't have the source to be able to provide for what the bill and the problem was. But God taught me a strategy in that moment. He taught me, bro, Caleb, he says, whenever you do things for me, I'll bring the provision to meet you before the need shows up. And I got a word for somebody right now. You might not be called to pastor a church like I was, but if you called to be a child of God, he said, whenever you live for me, I will make provision show up before the need even arises. But preacher, I'm going through something right now. Yeah, you better check how you're living. Because when I'm living for God, even when the reality of the lack shows up, he sends provision my way. Somebody coming to knock on my door. Somebody doing to touch my case. Somebody doing to send me a check in the mail. Because he told me provision is my portion when I live for him. 
He said, but you got to understand the strategy. I got you in this situation right now for you to stop trusting in people. Don't call your home. Don't ask him for no loan. Don't ask your stick man to give you a few dollars until next week. He said, while you're in it, learn the strategy. I am the source of your strength. I am the strength of your life. All you got to do is trust. So we all here, so please be seated. I'm going to preach in a minute, I promise, I promise. But I'm make sure you catch this before you go home to understand that God has me in what I'm in right now. Not that the timing is wrong. He's just giving me a strategy. Dad, he's just giving you a strategy right now. He said, I won't let you go under. I won't let you be embarrassed. I won't let you be ashamed. I'm just trying to give you a strategy. I'm just trying to teach you some new things about me. And if you learn how to trust me with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways and knowledge, me, he says, I'm going to direct your path. She said, Pastor, I got the situation under control. I'm just teaching you a strategy. Yeah. Oh, God, he says, it requires me to take you to take back strategy. But how do I get the take back strategy? I get the take back strategy first lady by having a take down strategy. Oh, yeah. Let me help you. I'm still, I'm still in point two. I ain't even got the three where I'm gonna really get excited and go home. But the take down strategy, Minister Black, the take down strategy is not one that causes you to succumb to or to give up. But the take down strategy is what you're writing. When one is doing notes, they, they say you can take down yeah. your notes. You, yeah. you can write out the notes. Yes, the take down strategy. Which Miss David understood that not only was there experience that I have, but there's some things that have been written already yeah. about what God has done for me. Yeah. The Bible shows us in First Chronicles 29 and 29, before David was getting ready to leave the scene and Solomon was getting ready to take over kingship. The Bible says, but all the acts of David and how he defeated giants and how he overcame issues yes, are not they written in the book of the Chronicles yes, of the King? Yes, are not they written in the book of Samuel the prophet and written in the book of Nathan the seer? Are they not written? What are you trying to tell me? There are some things that I'm going to get through because I went back to the takedown strategy. That while I was in church, I wouldn't just high-fiving my neighbor, but I was writing down some stuff. I was taking down some promises that the Lord spoke over my life. So now, when the difficulty arises, I just review my takedown strategy because I wrote down that the blessing of the Lord makes rich and added no sorrow with it because I took down that I am the head and not the tail because I'm above only and not beneath. I am the lifter and not the bottom. I took down that me and all these things are yes. more than a cover yes, to him that loved me. I took down that God is not a man yes. that he should lie. Yes. I needed a son man that he yes. should repent. Yes. He said and said he not do it or have he spoken yes. and shall he not make it good. I took yes. down yes. that God is with me. Yes. Wherever it is that I go because of my yes. take down daily, I can take back what the enemy stole. Yes. 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 Somebody yeah. and making them tap out. How was your takedown game? Yeah. 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 There is a necessity for a takedown strategy. Take I've got to go back and chronicle the things that God, for Elliot, has done in my life. Here's the exciting thing not only did David take down his victories, but David took down his defeats. Help me to preach Jesus before I go home. I don't know about you, but I'm going to give you a little bit into my own life. Back in the year 2011, my wife and I had made a determination that we were going to see this thing through all the way as it related to us bringing a son into the world. And my wife got a call from a place that was specializing in IVF procedures for wounders, and they specialized in different medicines that they would use. And they called my wife and said, we see that you meet the criteria connected to a, 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 a drug, a 
the medication that we want to give you, we're going to allow you to go through IVF free of charge. We just need you to take these medications. And my wife and I, we prayed about it. And I said, God, I don't want to be the one that said when you said you were going to do it, that I looked another way instead of the way that you were showing me. That's a word for somebody. That when God says, I'm going to do a thing, I didn't want to be the one that said no because it wasn't the way that I thought he was going to come. That wasn't God. And I said, God, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put our eggs in this basket and we're going to walk this thing out with you. And if this is the way you want us to go, so be it. But if not, we'll still give your name to praise. And as we began to go through our process, my wife every day would write in a journal connected to how she was feeling. And as we were getting closer to the time of there being a transfer and there being a potential implantation, she would exercise that faith even more. And she would write down in her journal every day connected to what she believed God was doing. And I would ask, first lady, what are you doing? She says, I'm just writing down so that our son can have something to read. And I said, okay, I get that. I like that. that that's good. What's the saying? Let's keep doing that. And every day she would do it. And we got to the place that she was getting ready to take the test. And when she took the test, it came back negative. And I said, my God, what a blow this was. But I said, first lady, whatever you do, don't throw away that journal. Because whenever he shows up, and he is going to show up, I'm going to show him back in 2011 when we thought he was on the way. We're going to show him what our takedown strategy was. He's alive. I'm going to show that to your son. Because I need him to know that his daddy knows what disappointment is. So he doesn't have to go through it. I need him to know that his daddy knows what hurt looks like. So he doesn't have to go through it. But brother, I got a word for you. The hurt that you went through is for your journey not have to go through it. I went through it so you can get over it. But we have to have a takedown strategy and not quit on it when it didn't work. You're missing it, you're missing it. Just because God spoke a word in 2015 when you first came to the church and God has not yet fulfilled that word, don't throw away your takedown strategy. If I were you, I would go fetch it out again today and reread it and see what the Lord is up to. I got to get out of here. All right, let me, let me go home. So after, I, I know in taking it back, I have to require, it requires us to take in. Not only does it require us to take in, but it requires us to take back, have a take back strategy and also a take down strategy. The final point I'm going on this one. Thank you for obliging me these 29 minutes and 32 seconds that you have. As you give me five more minutes, I promise I'm gone. The last point that I want to give us is this. It requires not only to take in, not only to take back and to take down. Oh God, this is the one minute's and lips go. But it requires us to have a take after strategy. Oh God, it's good. But I'm going to take my time. I've got to take after somebody. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so David, but before Amar, he was successful, he says, I got to get the right order. But where did I find the order? He found that it was Moses who had the order. So he says, in order for me to be able to be successful in Come taking on, my time, I got to take after Moses. Right. Yeah, yeah. Taking after means I got to do it just like Moses did. Mm. Okay. Uh, he says, I, I've got to get the stage the right way. That's right. I, I've got to get the Levites in the right yeah. order. And one thing that I was missing last time, I ain't really, I wasn't really praising God. So now I got to worship Him in the process of it. And the scripture said that after he took after Moses, he went about six steps. And after the six steps, he saw everything was alright. He began to dance before the Lord. And he says, alright guys, let's go a little further. And he called he man and Asaph. These guys who were no singers. He man as a type of a choir director. He says after we take the next six steps on the seventh one, I want us to sing the hymn unto the Lord. And the Bible says that he did this until he got to the gate of the city. And when he got to the gate of the city, Minister Williams said, he had to kick it up his no more. He said, but God 
did it for me all the way up to now. I'm getting ready to play for the Lord. And the Bible says that King David begins to dance out of his throne. And so much so that he became almost as a vow man. And there was this woman that was looking from the window by the name of Michael. A woman who was the daughter of Saul. A woman who was now supposed to have been his wife. She looks out of the window and she says, how uncommon was the king today that you uncovered yourself in front of all the handmaidens and the subjects. David says, maybe you forgot that God chose me instead of your check up there. Maybe you forgot that God anointed me to do what your fickle father couldn't do. And because I was dancing before the Lord, I became even more undignified than this. Next time, I'm going to my pants. I'm going to shout like I'm crazy for the Lord. And he says, because you thought I was doing it for show, I need you to realize it was God's favor because I took after Moses. Preach it when you're trying to tell it. How can I connect this thing to get us all the way home? The Bible tells me that I need to be a with Moses. The Bible says that David had some very unique characteristics. They had three things about David that he had going for him. The Bible says he was of a beautiful countenance. He was a goodly child. And he was ready. Okay, he was a beautiful countenance. He was a goodly child. And he was ready. Alright, the countenance part. I find that the only way we get a beautiful countenance is by spending time in prayer. So how do you know that? Because in Luke 9, the 29th, the 29th verse of the 9th chapter of Luke, it tells me that when Jesus was praying, his countenance was all because of his prayer. So I'm finding that I begin to take after Jesus when I learn how to pray. Stick with me on this. Not only was David of a beautiful countenance, but the Bible says David was of goodly character. I begin to think my who else had good things happening in their lives. When I go back to the book of Genesis, the first chapter, and I look in various verses, verse 10, verse 15, verse 21, verse 28, verse 35, I identify that in those verses, everything God did, he said it was good. So what I'm identifying is prayer like Jesus makes my countenance beautiful. Goodness like David makes me connect with God. But what is important about the ruddy? When I look at the word ruddy, it's defined as being a reddish color. David in and of himself looked like he was red. The Bible says that the red of David was so beautiful that folk didn't even think he was fit to be a king because of how beautiful his red was. I don't know if anybody knows what else is red, but I think blood is red. And the Bible says that when Jesus was on his way to being glorified, as he's going through his cross experience, they planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. I don't know if you realize what thorns do, but thorns pierce through skin and make what's inside come out. The Bible shows me that David looked like yes. Jesus because of the blood that was on Jesus oh. matched the, the color of the complexion of David's skin. Yes, so I'm identifying that if I'm going to take my time, uh, I've got to look like Jesus, yeah. i got to act like David, and i got to be like God. Come on, come on. i got to look like Jesus, i got to act like David, and i got to be like God. But well, we already know how Jesus looks because the Bible tells us that he's so beautiful but it's the black that when we see him, we're going to find and see him as he is. Yes. Because right now, I can't put a real description yeah. of who he is. But the one thing I can say is that he looks good. You yeah. How do I know that Jesus looks good? Because every time he shows up, something good happens. So whenever I see good, it looks like Jesus. So when you start learning how to do good, you'll start looking like God and acting like this. David, as a worshiper, realized that the way I'm going to take my time is that I've got to learn how to praise beyond my pain. That even when problems and frustrations are persistent, I've got to praise beyond my pain. Which, what are you trying to tell me? We all got an opportunity right now to act just like David. We can praise God in the face of our pain. You have to put your pain in the forefront of your mind. Whether it's mental, whether it's physical, whether it's financial, whether it's social. And right now, I'm putting a David on it. I'm praising God. When other people tell me to be quiet, I'm praising God.
praising God when other people talk yeah, about yeah. my worship. I'm blessing God when I walk my way to not having what I thought I had. I'm giving God the praise yeah. that my daughter's going through. I'm giving God the praise that my daddy is going through. I'm giving God the praise for my cousin that's going through. I'm giving God the praise for my nephew that's going through. I'm going to say, I'm going I'm taking my time right now. I'm putting back what the enemy tried to steal from me. And I'm putting a praise on it. You have to magnify the Lord with me and exalt his name in me. Do you know what I From the rising of the sun to the going down of the sun, the Lord's name is to be praised. Oh, bless the Lord. Oh, bless the Lord. And all that is within me. Bless his holy name. tuning in to today's message. We pray that something was shared that would help you along your Christian journey. We realize that not everyone will be able to make it into the house of God here, but we do know the importance of expanding the kingdom beyond the walls. And so we understanding that not everyone is connected to the body of Christ. We're asking today that if you desire just to let Jesus in your heart, pray this simple prayer with me. Say, Jesus, please forgive me. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead just for me. If you prayed that simple prayer, you're now a part of the kingdom of God. We also understand that there are those of us who have given our hearts to Jesus in the past, but find ourselves in a backslidden condition. The Bible teaches us that God himself is married to the backslider. And because he's married to us, he's always welcoming us back with open arms. Pray this simple prayer with me today. Lord, please forgive me for any sin that I may have committed. Renew me, restore me, bring me back into right relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that simple prayer, you've just been restored. We understand that it is important to chronicle our spiritual journey. So we would ask, if you would, please just leave us a message. Let us know of the spiritual decision you made today that we can keep you in prayer and walk with you along your path. We thank God for you. We love you. And until next time, be blessed.